What do you attribute your flex? We're, we're live. I'll give you an introduction in post, but uh, yeah. what do you attribute your flexibility to? Uh, I'm a midget. <laughs> do midgets have better flexibility? I think so. Because I I, when someone asks me to touch my toes, they're not that far away. I can always touch my toes. <laughs> God, I've never been able to touch my toes. Yeah. See, some people. I'm jealous. I was really, uh, Kern Caples, uh, one day he got hurt and I brought him to see Tim Brown. And he's like, can you touch your toes? And Kern, best skateboarder in the world, couldn't touch his toes. Really? But he was also sprouting. He was yeah, like, yeah. you know, getting taller and yeah. Crazy. Yeah, being young, that's fun. That helps. Yeah. It definitely helps with flexibility. Um, well, since we're on the subject, let's start with an injury update. Yeah. How was your uh, stingray laceration? <laughs> my stingray is okay, but geez, they... Um, they pack a punch. No kidding. Yeah. Have you ever been stung? I have. It's been years though. Yeah. I'm surprised that more people don't. Now that I got hit, I'm like, I think they're everywhere. Um, and when I got hit, it was really obvious. It was super stupid. It was like flat, uh, really low tide at Doheny. And we were on this little sandbar and I was pushing my son and his friend into waves. Um, and it was like kind of the like classic stingray environment. Yep. And I was just too stupid. And I just like, I, I felt like, you know, I, th I thought I stepped on glass at first. Yep. And then I felt the thing move and it really, then it like, because I didn't, I kind of pulled my foot away, but it's almost like I felt like I stepped on glass and I kind of like, was like, what did I step on? And then it went, wham. And, uh, you know, it was just funny because I had kids in the water and I knew if I freaked him out. Yeah. Then the surfing experience is over. I'm like, okay, guys, time to go in. And they're like, oh, we want to catch more. I'm like, let's just go in for a little bit. Let's get out of the sun. And then, you know, there's a trail of blood and it was like squirting. I was like, oh, man. How painful was it? It, it super painful at moments, but it was more of like, once I realized, like a, f a friend of mine, it actually went through his Achilles. Yeah. Oh, and dang. He had to have surgery and all this stuff. And once I realized that it, the barb wasn't in there and Dead. I was like, I'm fine. It's just going to be a little bit painful for an hour or two. Um, last time I got stung was probably five years ago now. And it was the same thing. My nephews were with me pushing them in and uh, I did the opposite of you. I fully freaked out and the kids are just like panicked. Still haven't been back in the water. Totally, since. <laughs> totally traumatized. And what was even funnier is like, I'm their uncle. They probably saw me catch some waves. They thought I was cool. They thought I was like, there. you started screaming. And then I'm screaming and then I'm seething, like driving to the lifeguard tower, just like, <sighs> like I couldn't control the pain, right? Then we get into the lifeguard station and there's a little girl, like a 10 year old girl soaking her foot in a bucket. And she's like, yeah, totally it's not that fun. bad. And I'm just like seething. And my, my nephews are looking at me just like, dude, you're such a wimp. We, you were our hero yeah. 20 minutes ago. Now you, you just fell from yeah, grace. Yeah, exactly. And ultimately what I've learned and just from talking to different people. people different ways. It, well, they inject different amounts of venom too or yeah. poison or whatever, uh, depending on which size of stingray and how good they get you and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it could be insignificant or it could be. Or she's that. just a lot tougher than you. It's There's that totally too. cool. <laughs> totally fine. Not only are children more flexible, yes. their pain threshold is way higher. Way too. higher. Um, <laughs> but the the yeah. water, the hot water neutralizes the protein that's in the venom. Stops it. It's it's key. If you didn't have hot water, it'd be a nightmare. Uh, I had a lot of people offering to pee on it. Exactly. Yeah, that's that an doesn't do anything. Ongoing joke. Yeah. It's warm. The warm probably helps momentarily. Momentarily. You'd have to have, be soaking your foot in piss. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Hey, everybody, fill up a bucket. <laughs> I, yeah, I had a lot of people offering. That's funny. Um, seriously, though, let's get an injury update <laughs> Yeah, I, on uh, John. Yeah, I think, um, I think he's doing great. I mean, he is the most sort of focused person I've ever, like, Sadly, he's been through this a few times. Yeah. Um, and so he he knows how to put his energy into healing. He's he's become really, really smart about, uh, I was joking the other day with him. I'm like, you know, you could be a doctor at this. Like you could, you could pass the class, you know, certainly. Um, he's been through this. He understands it. And, um, you know, again, for better, for worse, he has a great team around him because he's been through this. Um, and so... 
every day he's going to see different people. He's doing therapy. And I mean, he really is putting every ounce of attention on it. It's pretty rad. Um, so I don't deny that. I'm wondering, has he stated what the injury actually is and what the prognosis is? I don't feel like he has. Yeah, he said he put up on his Instagram the other day. He had an ACL tear. Got it. Um, and so they had a, um, I'm not a doctor, so I will completely mess this up, but um, they repaired it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd have to refer back to them how they did it. But it sounds like it wasn't a full reconstruction. Um, and I'm only taking the, the cliff notes from what they've told me. Um, obviously, I didn't do it. Um, but it sounds like he still has a chance. You know, it's a, I won't even say an outside chance for the Olympics. I mean, uh, <laughs> we went sailing the other day. Um, I'm taking sailing lessons, which is something I've always wanted to do. And so John and Lauren came on their way back. And uh, it, I'm laughing because every day it's been windy. And the one day it wasn't windy was the day we went sailing. Um, but, you know, he can he can bend his knee. He, he's walking on. He's not using a crutch. He can literally go to 90 degrees. You know, he's, he's making a lot of progress. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. It sounds painful. Yeah. Um, but... He seemed to be in pretty good spirits, you know, overall. I mean, again, he's been through this. And, you know, I, I just, I do really feel for him and Kolohe uh, specifically. Just, he, they put a lot of time and energy to go to the Olympics. And um, I want them to go, you know, and not even like uh, there's all this stuff about Kelly going, which would be great too. Like, no, it's just, it's a neat opportunity. Um, Kelly should go whether he's on the team or not, or he's competing. But, um, you know, yeah, it's you, you put your time and energy into this goal. It would be a pity if um, if you didn't go because of an injury like this. Completely. Yeah. They earned the spot. They earned the spot, you know. And, and it's not even just like, you know, you think about it. Um, it's not even just the year that leads up to it. It's the years of competition and time and dedication you know, um, that's that's just kind of it. And I, it doesn't sound like the Olympics are going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a challenge. Um, but certainly the camaraderie and, you know, in 20 years, whatever, looking back and yeah. going, I went to the first Olympics, would be super cool. So I am knocking on wood. I hope um, everything goes accordingly. And he's riding one of those Paisel dark arts and two-foot Chiba. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully better than two foot. Yeah, but yeah. All right, cool. Well, um, I guess we're taking it day by day. Yeah. Um, um, do these chairs have like little feathers? They're like uh, sticking in my back. So I'm are they not, really? Yeah. It's it. I'm totally fine. But okay. if you notice me like twitching here, got it. Got I'm it, trying got to it. find the comfortable spot. This chair is featherless, or I haven't noticed it. Anyways, we're wearing the same shirt, so we you are. think yes. you would think we would feel the yes. same thing. Can you tilt your mic just a turn to the uh, to Towards your me? right? That's perfect. Yep. Right there is fine. Cool. Um, all right. So speaking of shirts, let's do some talk on Florence Marine X. Yes. I don't want to focus all of our conversation nope. on it, but really it's what people want to know about, to be honest. I would love to hear that. Congrats on the job. Thank you. Yeah. President. Been, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, you, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you worked in marketing for Hurley. You yep. worked as the senior vice president of tours. Sports more. Oh, yep. And then I worked at for WSL. The WSL. Yep. So president is a different title. I would imagine um, it's it's a bigger title. It's a different role. Yeah, it's a different role. It's a lot of the same skill set. Like, I mean, um, look, we're really fortunate because the people that, um, that I'm working with, it's a lot of the same people I worked with before. Um, everybody is really, really talented at what they do, uh, which is great. Um, and it's kind of all the same. Like, uh, certainly I'm learning new things about like timelines, production schedules, things like that, but they're not, um, it's not rocket scientists, okay. science, you know, where it's just like, Hey, you got to get this done by this time. So it ships on the right time. Um, but we certainly aren't looking to do things exactly like we used to, which is kind of the fun. It's like, it's all sort of new. Um, and what we're trying to do is kind of, I would almost say approach it backwards and just go, Hey, what do people actually need? Let's think about that and not just, Hey, we used to do this in the past. So this is what we need to do. So I would say that there's sort of no better time to actually start that process than what we're doing now, uh, than what's happening now. Um, 
you know, a lot of these, uh, and I'll just say from past experience, you get into this cycle and it's like, hey, we need to fill these 20 spots. And so you just kind of keep going. You're like, well, why do you, why are we making those products? Well, we have 20 spots to fill. We're trying to approach it different and like, and just be very um, purposeful in why we want to make a jacket that is great for sailing, or it's going to be the one that you roll up and put in your board bag, or it's going to be the one that you're walking down the street and you just have to have. And we're going to like obsess and take time on that. Um, rather than like, hey, shoot, we need to make this, put this jacket out. It needs to cost 15 bucks um, because that's what we think an account will pay for it. Um, it's just a different behavior. And um, so it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's challenging, though, because we have to challenge ourselves to also start a new process and, and look at it, um, you know, and, and not fall back into those same behaviors. Right. Which is the challenge. Um, do you have any anxieties or fears about the uh, weight of the role of president? Um, I, my only anxiety is like, Hey, I'm a, like such a big fan of John. Like I, I, you know, I've known John since he was probably six or seven years old. Um, I just really like, it's, it's his name. And it's like, you know, every day I think we all have the passion to make it like happen. The, the job title, to be honest with you is we're a small company. If this was like Apple, (laughs) you know, we're all sort of in the trenches. We all sit at a table together and we make decisions, you know, and everybody has their things they're doing. Um, I don't really look at it. I, I've never really looked at that kind of stuff. More like, hey, we have a great opportunity. Um, people have responded very positive um, to what we're doing. And so I kind of go in every day pretty pumped and you just sort of, yeah, focus. Um, there was nobody in the position before you took it. Yes. So obviously the company and product hadn't been released and all that sort of stuff. But what is their expectation for you in the job title? Um, I think just to contribute. And I, I, again, is the group that we, that we have, everybody's very, very good at what they, uh, what they're there for. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, I like, I honestly, we, it's, it's pretty fun. So our office is right on Coast Highway in Newport. Um, we surf together. Um, when we're done, we all sit. We have a table that sits outside the office. And there's about, you know, eight, ten of us. And we all have lunch together every day. We don't do it because we have to. Yeah. We do it because we like to. And everybody kind of likes to hang out together. And whether we're talking about work or not, like we kind of, you know, the there's no sort of iron fist and like, hey, you have to do this. Um, there certainly isn't a barcode that you're checking in and out of to get to work. It's there's a responsibility to just go, hey, let's get this done. We we have an opportunity um, to do something that is super different. You know, we we kind of in some ways can do what we want. Right which is really interesting. We don't have 20 spots on a wall that we have to figure out. We just need to make great product that people are going to be stoked on. It's, I think it's an amazing time for surfing. Yeah. Um, like, I feel that way about what we're doing with the podcast. It's There would have never been an inroad for us 10 and 15 years ago, you know, but through technology and the democratization of that yeah. and direct access to the audience and all that. But... Meanwhile, there's been an upending of the legacy brands as well, both for media and clothing. And so they've lost all their market share and um, we're kind of the last, now there's all these creatives kind of just creating. And there's also a bunch of wayward talent, which is perfect for you guys. Yeah. You know, the disbanding of Hurley essentially leaves very talented, um, experienced people available. And I'm sure some of them go and work for big companies that are not in the surf brand, but it also allows for this opportunity for these kind of things to take all of that experience and yeah, and do it efficiently, smarter, leaner, all that stuff. I think the other thing that I've noticed, um, we've been sort of going to see shops and doing road trips. Yeah. Um, I've heard this a few times um, that if you're a hard goods rep right now, 
you're really busy. And you used to be sort of like the guy like, oh, yeah, you know, so-and-so's here. You know, go look at the futures box or the, yeah, whatever, whatever. Right. But when you come in, you're a rock star right now. And, you know, the, we've all experienced it. The lineup is more, uh, more busy. Um, I was up at Timmy Patterson's right now. Their business is rocking. Um, Italo was in town, super neat. Um, but just it's a, it, the excitement and energy about, you know, a, about participating in the sport, but not even just the sport, just the, like, getting out there and surfing. I mean, we're sitting here today in, you know, these beautiful surfboards all around us. Um, everybody just wants to, I mean, I, I don't want to sound cheesy, but just get out there and, like, do, they're doing things. Um, and I think it was already, like, I think the pandemic had basically taken things that would have taken three to five years to happen, and it just made it happen in an instant. Totally. And this transformation from just going, hey, yeah, kids are still looking at their phones and stuff like that, and they're still playing baseball and soccer. They're not stopping those sports and those behaviors, but they are engaging in being in the ocean and around friends in a different way. Um, and it's not just kids. It's it's sort of across the board totally. um, is what we've seen. And so um, – it is really a fun time. How was the brand conceived of and whose concept was it? Was it entirely John John's or? Uh, there's a pretty funny story, actually. Um, not, um, so as the brand was coming, taking shape, um, they, you know, um, Bob Hurley and his sons, uh, Jeff Ryan, and then Chance King, who is married to um, uh, Bob's daughter, Rachel, they were the f sort of founding group. Um, they started this sort of company, Kandui, which is now Simple and Florence. Um, and uh, there's just been a great relationship amongst through the time with the family and, and, um, and with John. And, you know, when the Hurley thing ended, the boys left to go do, you know, they saw the writing on the wall. They're like, hey, let's go do something different. Um, and they ha they've had some really interesting just ideas and super smart, super smart guys. Um, but as John started to engage, it was like, okay, John, we're going to put you to work. And he's like, okay, um, you're going to write the mission statement. And so John spit it out in like two seconds. And, you know, it's about exploring and doing it sustain uh, responsibly, you know, um, and making products that, you know, you believe in. And it was like this beautiful thing that he wrote in two seconds. And every time someone asked me, they like, how long did that take? And I'm like, well, John's always talked about that. You know, um, the way that he lives his life, his focus every day is about doing rad things in the ocean and, and you know, being outside and engaging. This is actually him. This isn't like a, you know, and I know, like everybody has their sort of marketing line, sure. You know, um, but sort of for us, it's pretty interesting. If like, hey, if we can actually solve for things that John's doing, we actually are going to make amazing product, and people want that. And so that's kind of how it started to come around. And you know, reflecting and and I I think the thing that um, I'm always sort of careful about, I don't want to throw any like shade at any of the brands or any of those things because. They've done a fantastic job. They run great businesses. There's no sort of negativity there. But as we think about what we want to do, it isn't like we're running away from that. We just see a huge opportunity to actually really address those issues and not just sort of the 20 SKUs that are supposed to be on the wall. Um, and that sort of was the genesis. And I think that's what got John the most excited. Um, John is a really, really smart um, passionate person and if I gave him a crappy product and said hey you have to wear it it was r really hard and he wasn't one to like he's not a he's not mean but you could tell like hey I'm not super stoked to wear this right um, that's why like when we started the board short that he won at the pipe masters that's our first that was the first product that was the first thing that that the company did was make um, a board short that John wanted. And, um, you know, that right now, when you actually physically hold that board short, you're like, okay, I get it. This is, this is a real product. Um, and 
it's something that I've, you know, again, when I've gone around and I hand people, it's like, you know, it's funny. John said to us, he says, hey, what's your dream board short? He's like, I don't want a stretchy board short. And we're like, crap. Yeah. <laughs> what do you need mean? some stretch. We're like, you don't want a stretchy board short. You, wait, what do you want? And so we're like, okay, why don't you go and, you know, grab a, you know, your favorite short. And he grabbed it and it was stretchy. Uh, but what he equated to stretchy is what ends up happening over time is you start to use thinner, thinner, wafier materials until you get to a short that actually just feels like it, it feels like nothing. Um, and then they ultimately fall apart. And so the goal from the team was to build something that actually had a little bit of durability um, that wasn't going to fall apart. And that was kind of the focus was like, you know, let's make that. So when you feel the short now, there's some weight to it. It actually feels like a product. And um, yeah, so it's been cool. You um, are talking about doing things differently. Yeah. And I, we will talk about how you're doing things differently, um, kind of ethically. But what does it look like? Who's your tar target demographic? Is it just surfers? Is it sailors? Like, how are you doing? What need are you providing for the marketplace differently? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, through time, you know, we will evolve. And I think ultimately, we don't necessarily look at like, hey, we're trying to target the 16 year old kid from, you know, because that's a typical brand behavior. Um, we're actually just trying to make product that um, allows people to get outside and like, just do things, right. But it isn't, you know, definitely, we are making stuff around the water. Um, but certainly a lot of these products can be used anywhere. And, um, you know, I think it's easier for me to think about like, hey, we're probably not going to be making 50 pairs of pants and jeans and things like that, right? We're going to be more focused on stuff that, um, you know, is inspiring people to, hey, wake up and go for a hike. You know, we're going to make that. We're going to say, hey, if you want, you can go swim in that same product, you know, uh, be in the water for longer. If you think about one of the products that um, has been the most talked about is the hooded rash guard. And that's specifically a John request says, hey, you know, I'm a blonde haired guy, you know, you know, living in Hawaii. And I keep going in, the waves are fun because I'm sunburned. And so he just, he wanted something that he can just pull over his head. He's waiting for a wave. A wave comes, he flips it back. He paddles back out, you know. Um, so just little things like that. And, um, with John's insight and his focus, it kind of opens up that sort of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's kind of how we're going to look at it different. I've seen fishing versions of that yeah. product, but I don't know that I've seen one specific to surf. Well, when you actually scratch the surface, there's a lot of people who do, there's a lot of great brands out there that are doing things you just don't necessarily see them in the surf space yeah. or at least. And, and I, I think also like the obvious um, place to start is, you know, in where we fit today is maybe in surf, but as we sort of broaden our, our um, line uh, and look at different products, you know, we've already had a lot of people looking at the hooded rash guard or the surf. Uh, we're making like a sun shirt with a hood as well. Um, great for fishing, you know, and, and even speaking to some accounts, they're like, hey, this is going to make a lot of sense because not only surfers shop in these accounts, like a lot of fishermen and a lot of people will come to our website uh, that have literally nothing to do with surfing. Yeah. You know, um, and it would be interesting to see how they use those products. Yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you look at Patagonia as an example, you know, it's like they certainly designed for a very specific thing initially and the credibility of doing that then made, it was appealing to all the weekend warriors as well who weren't actually doing the thing. So yeah, that's, similar. That's how, I mean, I think Patagonia started as a, like more of a climbing brand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it just like next thing you know, the down, it's like allows you to do some of the other Every, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Everybody wants to be the climber, but they're not actually out there on the rocks. You That's know, right. Um, so I think there's an obvious value to the brand's association with John. Certainly right now, he's at the zenith of his career. Um, 
how does that bode for the long-term viability of the company, that super tight association with one athlete. And um, I can't think of another brand who's done that successfully. I mean, Hurley was named after Bob, but Bob yeah. wasn't the athlete and it wasn't tied to his identity so much. It's just that the name worked and he was successful and all that. But is there a concern with this? No, uh, it's a great question. Um, I will give you a really good example of one that did work. Uh, the Jordan brand. Um, Michael Jordan is not the face. It is the face of the brand, but there are a million great athletes and great products that that brand has made since Michael Jordan stopped wearing the shoes. Um, I'm not saying that's the exact model, um, but uh, certainly there is a, a, a space for that. I also think... Uh, the important thing to think about as the brand evolves um, and John evolves over time, I've been very like, we, we all have, like we don't want this to be a quote unquote fan brand where it's like, right. Um, we're stressing out about every heat that John has. Exactly. This is a journey, you know, and like you, you've, I'm sure we've all heard this a million times, but um, this is, it's a marathon. It's not a race. And so, like, if we were trying to capitalize on John's competitive stuff, it would be a race and we'd be on this hamster wheel every day and we'd be probably making products that would be really different than what... Jerseys or something. Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly where I was going, is that, like, you know, we'd put a bunch of 12 gear out into the world and we would say, hey, that's this is a Florence brand and we're going to cash in and we may make a couple bucks for the next few years and then, you know, John would make some money and we'd sail off into the sunset. Um this is a long-term operation, and um, where this brand goes uh, is going to be connected to John, but is inspired by him. And the opportunity for us to get into different walks of life and, and um, passions is huge. And John's passion isn't just surfing. Sure. I mean, that's the thing. Is that's why it's, it's so great is that, you know, um, he wakes up in the morning, he looks outside, and he's like, okay, what is it a good day for? Um, that behavior I think is more typical of people today than it ever has been. Um, people are waking up and they want to, they want to explore, they want to, you know, do these things. You don't all have to ride a, you know, a six foot thruster and you may appreciate John for his ability to surf well but there's a lot more people that are going to be inspired by that behavior of getting out and wanting to, you know, what would it be like to go sail around the world? What would it be like to, you know, whatever it may be? Um, and I think that idea, it, that genesis is much bigger than any sort of like, you know, heat at trestles. Totally. I agree. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but maybe go into it more. What, were the problems that you identified in the clothing business at Hurley and either, you know, from a bloated product line or just ethically from running a big business like that? And how are you doing things differently? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't want to, there's no, like, I, I don't want to point at anything that people are doing bad. I can say for us, what we're going to do different, we're able to make decisions. Things aren't handed to us where we're like, you know, hey, we've always done it this way. This is why we're doing it. We're actually starting at, at, at zero. So um, the T-shirt that you're wearing is um, from a company in Spain. It's called Recover, Recover Text. Um, all those T-shirts are made from actually uh, the scraps of T-shirts that hit the ground at a mill. They regrind, they make thread, and it's that's a new T-shirt from basically stuff that was going to be thrown away. We're not making 200,000 t-shirts a year. We're making far less than that. Um, and so we're able to be able to be a little bit more insightful about what we want to use, um, how we want to use it. And we're actually starting at scratch. Um, and so um, we can decide to make, well, I think good business decisions are the same as you know, uh, being conscious and responsible. Um, but you don't have to do one or the other. And again, is people think like, and, and I think uh, this is both a blessing and a curse, is like 
because John is John and we have, you know, the boys at Hurley and Bob, this background, it's like, oh, they're just going to, you know, it's where I think that's our benefit is we're able to actually make decisions and start at scratch. Um, and when I say we're doing things different, um, we're intentionally just trying not to, well, trying not to fall back into the old stuff, but actually just like even our distribution, we started our our business off online by creating a membership program. And to actually buy product in the beginning, you actually had to become a member. You had to pay to become a member. I'm not sure many brands have started that way. Maybe they have. Not many in the surf industry for sure because, again, this is the way, you know, they've been around for a lot longer. Um, it was very intentional on our side because – we actually think there's huge value in, in creating these members. And we, you know, ultimately for us, like this is the beginning of something that we really want to, as this rolls over, we're going to deliver for our members, you know. And again, just a, 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 as you started, you know, the, the, the first yard line, you can decide to do sort of whatever you want. And we're going to be very... Um, particular about those decisions that we make i'd like you to explain the membership model um it seems like another way to say get on our mailing list uh, yeah because even even the 25 five dollar fee goes directly to the to your to the purchase of the product like you'll deduct the 25 bucks off the shopping cart yeah. so it actually didn't cost anything but it's a way for you to certainly capture email addresses, which you would capture through the transaction anyways. Yeah. So I didn't feel like it was nefarious in any way. I just thought it was a clever spin on join the mailing list and we'll send you some videos of John and stuff like that. Is there any added value to the membership or what's the concept of the membership? Yeah, that, well, okay, so there's a couple things. So um, yeah, there's no nefarious. Um, of course, yeah. But uh, the idea was sort of, to create something that there's a bit of a community and there is value that you have walked across this line. Um, and what you get on the other side is you get, uh, basically it's like a mileage bank where you, you, you know, every time you buy something, it goes into this and you get that back in product. Um, but we also wanted to create a little bit more of a one-to-one. -one. And so what we did is, you know, John, John is a content machine. And so John is building content all the time. Um, and I remember this at Hurley. John did like a backflip at Margaret River one day. Mm -hmm. He did this crazy thing. After they call off the event, I think. That was it. Peter King got it. And I, I remember going in my mind, we had been talking about this, uh, you know, about a way to really serve up these amazing moments in a more personal sort of way. And um, so we had talked about this idea of creating a membership. And so... You know, um, we are doing that now with Florence. And so um, uh, last week, John, had he did a 10-minute edit from Australia that all our members can see on our site. Um, you have to be a member to watch it. Um, that's one of a bunch of things that we'll do. Um, we're also going to release uh, member-exclusive products. So only member will be able to buy certain pieces. Um Right now, we're looking at um, new products that are coming out that we're going to keep behind membership for a period of time and at some point open them up. Uh, we've also talked about, you know, experiences, doing something really, really fun and cool where, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, let's just say there's, uh, a, a, let's say John's at Trestles and he's competing for the world title. Well, we may just, you know, take all of our members and have a special experience and that they can be a part of. Um, there's, there literally is so many ideas that we come up all day with new, new things. But becoming a member of this brand and participating in this sort of day-to-day -day is really, really important. Um, you know, and, and I think that's kind of what we're trying to do is, is create really a one-to-one -one relationship with those people. We don't Sure, we'd like to have hundreds of thousands. We like it as, you know, as this grows, it feels organic, it feels right. We're not just trying to make so much product and just shove it out there. Um, and it, it does feel like a little bit of a community. 
I think it's really smart. I think it's well conceived. And um, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also a little bit forward thinking too, because a problem that I think a lot of people are running into content creators or people in John John's situation is you're using other people's platforms all the time. And so it'd be better just to get everybody or all my fans on my platform and have the one-on-one, -on -one, of course. Yeah. But the problem with using everybody else's platforms is not only do they own the content or, you know, it's now public content. They own the relationship. And they all have their own different, um, like you can't post the same video on YouTube that you post on TikTok. TikTok has its own like little uh, culture. And so you want to make it specific to TikTok. Oh, right. And then Instagram has its own little culture. And Twitter, you know what? Work the text differently because Twitter, you have to have a different zing there. And so if you're really catering to all those platforms, it's five times the amount of work, mm -hmm. you know? And what people don't do the work. So then they do just upload the same exact video everywhere. Some places it takes off, other places it dies. And, you, and so then you're like, oh, no, I'm really good at the algorithm on YouTube. So I'm really going to focus energy there if I'm Ben Gravy or whoever. And that's great. And they figured out how to do that. But what if it changes? What if the algorithm changes? What if the culture changes? Right. Where the way you guys are doing it, it's like we own the platform and we have the one-on-one -on -one thing is really what people want anyways. That's what they're hoping to get out of YouTube. Yeah. That's what they're hoping to get out of Instagram. And you've already done it. So I think it's... It's still changing. early days. But yes, it's been fun so far. And it's been really positive. Um, Does the membership, uh, is there a renewal fee? Yep. It's a one-time cost. 20 bucks. You're in the club. Forever. The society. The society. Yes. The one kickback I've seen about the brand on the internet was the pricing of the wetsuits. Would we, you like to address this? Yeah, I honestly thought it was going to be way worse. It was the, you know, um, so uh, we, we got into wetsuits um, because we want to make them. John, you know, um, uh, he's in a wetsuit a lot. Um, but we use Japanese manufacturing, Japanese materials, and they're so expensive. And um, Why? You know, each one of them is handmade, so it's not like they don't just put, um, you know, 50 sheets of neoprene and do the cut and then sort of stick things together. Every wetsuit is handmade. Um, they're just expensive. And, you know, the, the jacket is 250 bucks. And um, our cost for that wetsuit, to be honest, is not much less than that. We don't make any money on the jacket. Um, but we're doing it because ultimately it's a great product. And this is where it's kind of a funny one is that we could definitely go make a cheaper jacket. We can go to the, you know, this, the, the thing in the surf industry, a lot of wetsuits are all made from the same factory. Um, we could easily go and make that. I'm not sure that makes a whole lot of sense. We're not trying to make a bunch of money out of wetsuits. I can just tell you that's not our goal. We'd, we're not in to take O'Neill's market share. Um, we want to make wetsuits because we think it's an important part of you know, our portfolio of product. But it's not like our like we don't go to sleep every night going, hey, how are we going to take O'Neill's market share? That's not it at all. Our wetsuit top and all of our wetsuits, it's kind of a point of difference. If you look at the price of the rest of our product, we're pretty in line, maybe a little bit higher because we're, we're doing some nicer products. But um, the wetsuit is the thing that sort of stands out there, but that's really what the cost is. Yeah. Like, so it's, you know, there's really nothing to hide behind. And it's kind of like, you know, hey, do we want to make a cheaper wetsuit? I'm not sure we do, to be honest. I, I don't think that, um, you know, I think, the other thing we've we've realized is when we go out and we meet with either surfers, people, whoever buys wetsuits, or these shops, they don't need another two hundred and fifty dollar wetsuit. They've got ten brands that are actually doing that for them. There's nothing for us to gain, and and we kind of look at it as like, hey, John, do you like your wetsuit jacket? He's like, dude, this is the best jacket I've ever had. Okay, cool. Next, yeah, <laughs> and and uh, you know, it's 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 probably not the most popular thing to say. Like some of these people, like I've seen the comments, um, but it's okay. You don't have to buy the jacket. I totally get it. Um, 
it's an amazing product. And and the one thing so I would say is that we also realize at least at some level of responsibility, like, hey, you buy these products. I'm still wearing Japanese wetsuits from three years ago. They last. They're really, really good. Um, you know, and you start to think about it. You're like, gosh, you know what? Hey, if I actually buy this wetsuit that's actually warmer and more comfortable, I actually may get to use it for two or three years. Maybe that's a better idea than kind of going and buying the one that's disposable. Again, it's a big purchase. That's that's totally up to to each person, but um, that's kind of the the thinking, anyways. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, if, I mean, if you're making them for John already and he wants the best, then you might as well. It's kind make of a hard. Few others. Once he started wearing them, he's like, uh, "Yeah, I want more of those." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, explain the name. Um. So I can explain it better be if John or Jeff, or, sure. you know, those guys did. But I think the initial idea was like, hey, is it, um, is it Florence? Is it, you know, and I think there was initial run of like, hey, can we get that, that trademarked? Um, takes a long time. That's probably going to be pretty hard. You know, there's a city, Florence. Um, there's also a shoe brand called Florence. That I didn't is, know that. Yep, that's made out of Asia. Um, so, you know, uh, it sets our intent. If, you know, what we want to do is we want to broaden. We want to make products that are feel great in the water and around the water. Um, and so I think it was more of a qualificate, like a, a defining piece yeah. is Marine X. Um, and, yeah, so that's kind of how it came to get together. And the X is exploration? Exploration, Got it. It's not like X Games. <laughs> <laughs> Expedition, maybe. Yeah. Um, I do want to cover a couple of questions about your former employer. Yes. <laughs> I figured. You can dis- you can decline That's to fine. respond yep. to any, yes. and we can even edit okay. if need be. Yep. Um, I know they're an easy target, obviously, and a lot of their good yeah. work doesn't go acknowledged. It goes unacknowledged, yeah. and then their hiccups get endless ridicule. Of course. I don't feel a need to pile on to any of those. Um and also any of my criticisms are also from a place, a strong desire of wanting the organization to, to succeed, yeah. obviously. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that goes without saying as well. Um, what's the goal of the organization, of the WSL? Ooh. From your time there, what was your experience? What do you think their goal is? Wow. Um, I think they have a pretty pure goal, to be honest. Um I didn't see, you know, in my time there, there was nothing like that was shocking or scary or nothing like that. Um, I think people probably have this, um, I think they have this sort of warped sense of what it should be and what it is. Um, You know, I think uh, I'm pretty tight with Dave Proden um, and Eric still as well. Um, You know, both are very passionate. Uh, certainly Dave has been there for a long time um, and is really passionate about best waves, best surfers, and th- that the tour is at the center of everything. Um, I think uh, them building a business around that has been challenging over the years for multiple reasons. Um, I actually think what Eric and Dave have pulled together right now and what they're working on that I, I, I can't go too deep into, but where the future of this uh, what the league is going to do is so crazy positive, is so good, um, and is kind of what is sort of needed to happen. Um, I think they're doing all the right things. Um, it's just, you know, people don't um, people don't talk about this, but pro surfing was a nonprofit business, and it it's uh, you know one year that I was on tour, um, you know, Gravel Mitchell came in and had to fund. The ASP, um, and we, I think, surfers didn't take prize money for the back half of the tour, or we gave up. I, I think it was like a percentage of our prize money at every event to keep the tour going. People don't know those things, you know. Um, the the fact that the Ziff family came in and have supported this thing and actually raised the level of not only the surf, you know, what you would expect but the broadcast and, and the reliability. I mean, 
forget, like before when we used to tune in, it was a different player. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. It was like, oh, shoot, I didn't download this player, and it doesn't work on this. And then, I mean, gosh, I remember at Trestles, um, you know, we had to build the website, and it broke. And it's like, you know, it was all these things, and we forget about those because we can get frustrated about whatever it is. Um, a judging call. Yes. Um, but it's, it's uh, these guys are doing fantastic. And um, so, you know, I think getting back to the question, I think the goal is the same as what everybody wants to see. They want to see undisputed world champions. They want to see um, the best waves and the best surfing all the time. Um, and I think that's what they're setting up to deliver. It, you know, we have to remember, like, all of last year and even this year is radically influenced by COVID. Um, you know, uh, those four events in Australia were absolutely incredible. Maybe not the don't line up to what I just said is best waves, best surfers. Um, but, you know, this is an anomaly. Uh if the goal is best waves, best surfers for the organization, then why is there going to be an ABC show about the ultimate surfer? Like, so, how does that factor in? Yeah, I think it does. Um, and, and I think if you sort of, um, again, like put this, the tour as the, the thing that everything else spins around, it's the center of the universe for them. You know, people get a chance to be on tour. It actually highlights how important the world tour is. Um, I think the ABC show is fine. Like, I think it's, it's, so, so I'll play a different one. Okay. So we so long, like a long time ago when I was on tour, um, the, we were trying to get into the X games. We got right. into the X games and then the ASP actually blocked us 48 hours before the X games. And then, um, like we, all the Americans were actually like, okay, we either do the X games or we're, and if we do the X Games, we're getting kicked off tour. But Kelly was doing it, so they weren't going to kick him off the tour. So I knew I was choosing the right side. <laughs> but the point was, is we we were never on national TV. We weren't getting any attention. You know, people forget, like, okay, so people are going to, like, dig into this, you know, ABC show. It's on prime television. They're talking about surfing with a goal of being on this world tour. That's actually really positive. We could easily go back to the day where the surfing is so niche that only the, you know, 15, 20 people that work in the industry actually care about it. Totally. And so I don't have a problem at all with them trying to do something different and actually expand the sport. Um, people dig in, say it's kooky and all that. I don't hey, worry about that. Yeah. It, it, I like, and, and I, I think you can. Um, but I'm also like, hey, like, let's give it a shot. There's actual energy happening. Like, people are doing stuff. I would be way more upset if the tour at this time, who had a supporter like they do in Dirk and, and you know, and they actually just did nothing. And they just said, hey, we're just going to sit on our hands and, and do this thing because it's safe. Yeah. So that, that to me is like, that's, I guess I understand the argument you, that you just made like that, um, ABC show will open up the audience. Certainly it'll surfing will now appeal to a bunch of new people who then ultimately might watch, like it'll grow viewership ultimately yep. for the WSL. But how does that relate to getting the best surfers in the best waves? Um, because you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I don't think that you need I think it all fuels the, the the thing. Like, it doesn't, that doesn't need to be uh, directed. I, I mean, ultimately, those people are competing to get onto the tour. Like, that's their goal. And so you've almost elevated this idea of being on the world tour. Most people probably who will watch this show have no idea that there's actually a tour that goes around from Tahiti to Australia to Fiji to Indian. Like, wait, what? Um, I think them uh, just sort of elevating what it means to be on tour because that's why these people, these men and women, are competing on this show for a chance to live out their dream. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and again, is the tour is, is going to do what the tour is doing. 
you're just bringing more attention to it. We talk about the importance of salt being in the building. And so with the WSL, that's kind of like you really do want professionals running the business. I think yeah. that'll benefit the business. But at the same time, you want to make sure there's salt in the building to yep. kind of help guide to steer the ship. Um, you're salty. <laughs> I'm did, salty. Did you feel that you had influence over the organization, being the salt in the building? And um, Yeah, I, I think that there's this misconception that there's sort of, and I think it's understandable that there's like, let's just say there's a table on one side, there's the surfers, and then the other side, there's the business. And there's a, a tug of war going on. Um, I never felt that. I, um, hey, in any competitive matter, Eric was not never looking to say, dude, we're doing this. You know, he's, he would look to me and go, dude, you tell me, you know, this stuff. I don't, um, I think that there is like a couple things that I, I would say, um, most of the people in there are, uh, they're really passionate about just doing the right thing. Um, and, uh, I would say all of them actually. Um, so my conversations with, with Eric have always been s super positive. He's never the one that saying, Hey, like, I don't care. <laughs> I, I never heard this. I don't care what you say. This is what we're doing. That never happened. Um, there's a lot of, um, Hey, can we try this? Can we try, you know, whatever. And it always passes by. The sort of the you know and it and it's like Jesse it's it was KP for a long time it's Renato it was myself um, hey is this a good idea is this a bad idea um, Dave is is a part of that as well um, and and again I'm going to flip it on the other side and say hey so conversely you could have a business that's just sort of boring and we're just going to be three to the beach because the con the other side of it is, hey, we just like the things the way they are, which isn't a good answer. Yeah, those aren't the only two sides. <laughs> I feel that like if we if we put them at eight foot cloud break, <laughs> there's inherent drama. There's inherent like the central drama there is man and woman versus nature. And then, of course, you have a competitor is the secondary thing. But I think that solves all the problems. I think that broadens the demographic of people who want to watch the thing. So let me ask you this. I got a question. Yeah. How many people should be on tour? Less than 32 males, I'd say. Why? I mean, 15. Uh, so you can run in one swell window. So you don't have to stick around for two weeks and have a lot of downtime in between events. You could also do the strike mission. You don't have to map them that far in advance. Um, and... In any given event, in the current kind of number Format. of, yeah, there we can identify who the top ten finishers will be with probably a ninety percent accuracy. I would say. Yeah. Do you think um, so? What about national diversity? Do you feel like it's important to have someone from Costa Rica, for example, or do you think that's not important? I think there needs to be an investment in the feeder system that gives those surfers an opportunity to get to that world tour level. Yeah. But I do not feel a need to mandate the diversity on the elite level. I think it can be a meritocracy, yeah. equal opportunity, but then, you know, meritocrat results. Do you feel like the tours need to be together? I don't. These are all conversations that we spent hundreds of hours maybe exaggerating, but a lot of time talking about. Um, and there's some really good debates on both sides. That's why I'm asking. Um, I personally feel that it's important that the tour stays, and I, I battled this both sides. Um, I like the number where it's at. I understand the reason to go smaller. I played with both sides. Um, the reason that I sort of fall in line with it staying at 32 or 34, um, was based on just like getting people from different countries. If we start to get this thing too tight, let's just say those top 10, we've excluded, we have a few Americans, maybe, right now, <laughs> barely an Australian. Yeah, I know. And Most Brazilians. Yeah. And so, okay, so now we've really restricted that access so radically. And the other thing that happens 
is you start to just overlap people competing against each other every time to where it is kind of nice to see a Liam O'Brien or someone kind of come through the field every now and again. So I'm not, I get the other side. I, I totally do. Um, I'm not sure the, f and, and then I'll go into like how these events actually get paid for and this, that there's enough interest in what, what laying out a, a two day event or a one day event um, versus actually people being there and actually building some audience and stuff. Um, I'm not sure that that actually pencils out. Again, no, that I don't wasn't, either. That yeah. wasn't my job. Yeah. But I, I, I definitely think there's a balance of those. And, and um, the idea today, and, and I, I think the other thing is there's a, a huge responsibility, I think, for those people in those roles. As you said, I believe super strongly that, you know, we've been talking about um, a, a, a revamped Bud Tour from back in the day. Those need to sprout up around the world because ultimately I think this national diversity is like really, really important. If we just keep going another 10 years and it's a bunch of Australians, a bunch of Americans, a bunch of Brazilians, it, it will lose steam a little bit. And, I, and the, the one thing that's really funny is that, you know, Fernando is going to do his ISA games in El Salvador. I'm really interested to see some of these other people surf. There's Olympic spots on the line. I think that's, I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And so I just don't think you need to mandate. I don't think you need to mandate it, but I think you need to have it broad enough that you can bring a couple people in. I know, and that's where the feeder system is important and investing in that, and that's probably a loss leader, to be honest. You know, that's a hard thing to monetize if well, you do it right. Well, and that's why if you think about, so, you know, people forget we, we made a big change to the tour, um, and it is, you know, starts with uh, 34 men, 18 women, and after five events, a third of the field goes away, so it would be a field of 24 and 12. You know, it's a three-day event for the men and women moving into the back half. So, you know, they start, they go five events, you cut a third of it out, and all of a sudden you have a three-day event for the back half back five events, um, but you've kept the funnel wide enough at the front, Yeah, actually allow some people to start. The other thing is, you know, you kind of have like, hey, the clock is ticking. You really don't have time for a bad result because right. all of a sudden now, that qualification got moved into five events. So again, we'll see. It could be a disaster. <laughs> I know. Um, and I level all of my criticism without any awareness of how things pencil out. Yeah. But I also kind of understand it seems like it hasn't penciled out great for the last 20 years. So why are we just trying to subtly tweak what hasn't penciled? Maybe a radical tweak. And I really felt like the COVID year was the year to really make some of those radical changes. And yeah. there could be an interim title maybe. And let's just get those top 10. Let's get them on a boat. Let's put them in you know, at Can Dewey or something and see what numbers that generates in terms of viewership, because it could be. Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think it's a pretty radical change. So if you think about what uh, the 22 tour will be, if because that will be the most pure, at least that was designed, you know, the tour will start in January, February, and end in, in August, you know, August, September. Um, and then you kind of push the back half, which is the, the challenger. Um, you have a cut and you have a world title event. Um, all of those are sort of radically new. Yeah. Um, and I think from a business standpoint, not my place to talk, but I actually do think it's pretty transformative for the business. Good. So um, I think that's a really positive one. Um, I appreciate you engaging in the conversation with the insights that you have. Yeah. Because I'm the voice of the internet, so I'm trying to like no, synthesize and not, and look, a lot of the, what people do give as feedback, you know? Yeah, and I, and I think, look, I'm, I'm not, um, I can't really speak for the WSL. Yeah. I can say that, you know, I'm like you where um, I'm, I want it to work I, I, and I, it will work. There's enough smart people and I think um, it's, it's, uh, 
I, I'm not coming to their defense. It's more of just a rational, hey, there is another side of it. Um, and um, it's, you know, I think that the you'd be surprised that everybody is pretty much on the same team doing trying to do the, the right thing. Um, but there are different things that sort of come up. And it's like, hey, you know, like I said, it's like, hey, they kind of have a great situation where, you know, Dirk is so supportive. Like, they're not taking a business, I'll, I'll say this one last, that was extremely successful yeah. before. They're taking a business and actually trying, they're trying to take something and actually make it a business. Um, and that's not, and, and, and still again, is like, when, I, when I'd see people like, you know, the hate coming across, it's like, hey, this is still free. Like, this is free content. Like, this is a pretty good product that you only have to engage on if you want to click yes or no. Yeah. And that's why I, the, the passion is great, but some of the negativity, I'm, what was it like? Jesus. Yeah, the internet's gnarly. It's gnarly. I got a DM last night on Instagram. It was a reply to a story I posted on the podcast account. And he's like, get off Instagram and publish a podcast. I'm like, I'm, dude, I'm I cranking just, out three a week. Like how much more, do you, like what, and by the way, what you just said, it's free. It's free. Like, and they're, I'm literally doing three a week. Like, are you crazy? You know? It's free. But, but thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, um, final question as it relates to the WSL. Was your timing of your job change, was it related to this imminent opportunity with Florence Marine X or was it related to something with the WSL? Uh. It, Kind of a combo, but um, definitely related to this. Um, I, you know, this is a this is a huge opportunity. These are people that I love that I was really excited to do something with. Um, also, you know, I was driving to Santa Monica um, to work, uh, which is you know at least two and a half hours one way. Brutal. Um, and kind of looked at it, going, "Hey, there's great people in that business. They, you know, they're going to be fine." Um, I probably don't want to do that drive. Um, that was, there was a bunch of things, but certainly this opportunity was exciting. Cool. Yeah. Um, a couple of wrap up questions just about you personally. What, uh, what's your current relationship like with surfing? How often are you surfing? All that sort of stuff. So my relationship with surfing is, uh, it's a love, love. Um, I surf every day. Good. Uh, Good for you. I do. I, I, um, people in the office will uh, tell you they, I make people paddle out in really bad waves. It's easy when the waves are good. You don't have to make anybody do anything. Um, but I try to surf every day. Um, I surf with my son when he lets me take him, uh, which takes up, you know, most of my time. Uh, yeah. How old is he? He's six. Okay. Yeah. Did you see that 11 year old do the, Flip in the pool. <laughs> it's crazy, dude. And did you see the backside front flip? That, uh, Akira. Yeah, Jesus. Oh my gosh! What a wonderful story, though. I loved her moxie to paddle up to Mick yeah, and be like, "Hey, I want to get into one of these. Can you help me?" Mm -hmm. And Mick's like, "Yeah, let's sit next to me. Let's do this. Giddy up! How cool is that?" He's such a good dude. That's and then she great. handled it. She handled it. She got. She didn't just get a decent wave. That's the that's a way better wave than I've ever gotten in my life. For sure, that wave way better. Unbelievable, and she yeah yeah it was unbelievable. That was rad. That's so amazing. Um, so in terms of your surfing, I'm thrilled to hear that. Can I ask how old you are? Forty nine. How do you maintain that, dude? What's your diet and exercise like? Are you dude, doing anything at all? No, I mean look, we're it's we joke around. All of our friends, you know, we're all getting everybody's getting older every day um but i you know i don't know i just i like to surf it makes me feel good um there's nothing else behind it i you know it's the one thing i can do in the day that i know that like changes my day um it makes me happy it sort of changes my mood um and so i try to do it you know i'm, I'm out there every day outside of when i got stung by the stingray i took two days off because my foot was swollen mm -hmm. um but uh yeah especially now that the you know it's light longer uh, the water's getting warmer it makes it easy are you doing any sort of um exercise regime other Just than stretching good for you and what's your stretch routine 
Is five it five minutes of just yoga? Pigeon. Oh, okay. Because Open up the I hips. have really tight hips. Okay. Um, but I'm not good with that. I'm so bad at like I look at Taylor and like freaking Kelly looks like he's 15. Like Jesus. Is um, that diet related? You think? Yeah, and I go to an office in the day. That'll zap the life out of you. Well, fluorescent lights will do it actually it's really easy to be super fit when you just get to go golf and surf all day that's a good point yeah <laughs> i think diet has a lot to, i'm learning well in through my mid to late 30s i'm learning diet has a tremendous amount to do with it does that. it's also you can make better decisions when you're out doing fun things playing golf and surfing it's like you just oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't think about eating right right until right. it's like oh i'm hungry i'll eat a little thing yeah, when you're around work, I'm like nervous energy. I'm eating food all totally. day. Are you are you into wine? I love wine. Uh, how serious are you into it? Like, what are you into? So I sort of quit during the week, but I'm, as far as, I'm not a pro. Are you collecting? Are you? Uh, not quite. Okay. Why? you're, you're uh, I used to work in the wine business. Did you? Yeah. So, so I was super into it for a good, good while. So good friend of mine, Rob Wilson, uh, opened up a restaurant called Glass Bar in Dana Point. Um, and so I, uh, I invested a very small bit, but what it does allow me to do is go to the wine parties and buy wine for, so that's nice. Wholesale price from the distributors? Yes. So the, the restaurant has like literally, he has impeccable taste. And so I just literally follow him around, kind of like the girl in McFanning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get his scraps. Um. When I worked in the business, we had, you know, those distributors coming by, those sales reps, yep. they each have a bag of 10 wines and they want to see you, you know, at least once a week and there's 20 of them. And so you schedule appointments. You're like, all right, yeah, 1030 with Southern wine and then 11 with the Young's and then wine warehouse, 1130. I had, I started a blog at the time just to track, to yeah, chronicle all the wines that I was tasting on a given day. Yeah. And you're spitting everything, of course, because yeah, you got to run you're drunk. and you got to run the business and stuff. But I I was tasting 300 wines a week. You got to be kidding. No. For a good period of time. And I knew it was a lot, but then I like started chronicling it Who and it was buying for? I had so I worked at a retail shop in Long Beach, and then I opened my own retail shop. Um No way. Yeah. So so it was retail. So retail, you do a lot more volume than yeah, restaurants. Restaurant. Like yeah. restaurant has a 20 or 30 or whatever wine numbers on the list, but retail, you got hundreds, you know? So, I mean, 300 wines a week, if you can imagine that. So not, not ever getting drunk, but your um, acumen gets so sharp, you know? It's like- You pick it up quick. Yeah, you know exactly what the Rhone Syrah tastes like or, you know, Bordeaux tastes like or whatever, right. yeah. Yeah, but I- uh, don't take it nearly as seriously at this point in my life. Can you still drink a shitty bottle of wine and feel it's okay? No, you can't. The great news for the consumer is there's no shitty high quality $10 wines now. Like the overall quality has gone through the roof, mm -hmm. through modernization and um, like winery cleanliness and the way that they make the wines, you know? It used to be, you know, if the winery wasn't clean, there could be a taint, a funk that, infects the wine and the wines taste off. Now everything's so sterilized that if you just crush it. Yeah, if you just grow, if you're in a wine growing region in the world and you grow decent fruit, crush it, get out of the way, put it in a bottle. You know, that's all you really need. Wait, really? So yeah, like $10 oh. Malbecs coming from Argentina. Those things are phenomenal. Argentina's always been so expensive for those wines too. It's crazy. We, um, Derek O'Neill, um, who... He was running Billabong at the time. I was with uh, Shane and Lisa. He had us over, and he opened a Chateau Margaux. And today, I can, I, I was like, that was the day. I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah. It actually the, the wine evaporated on my tongue, and I was like, dude, what is that? Yeah. And Do you then, have any idea what vintage it was? I don't. But I actually drove to Chateau Margaux because I'm like. Just okay. to take a photo. <laughs> I got to see this place. And they, it was, I couldn't go in. I was just looking at me. Yep. Yeah. They don't let you in. No. Um, I had the similar experience. I was working at a restaurant when I was, you know, whatever, 21 or something. And uh, yeah, customer brought, it was a nicer restaurant. A customer brought like a really nice bottle. 
and I didn't know what it was at the time, but I took it home at the end of the night so I could like look it up on the internet and it was $5,000 <gasps> a bottle, <laughs> but he let me have a glass of it. <gasps> so I was a server and I showed some interest and he's like, oh yeah, you can have some 2000 vintage, uh, domain Romani Conti in Burgundy yep. DRC. Yeah. And the vineyard site is Eshazo. So you can look it up. I don't know what the price is now, but, um, 2000 was like a really, I, I remember stellar that. vintage. Yeah. Yeah. In France specifically but yeah i was like i didn't know the price i didn't know what the bottle was he just like oh you can have a sip and it was the same thing that you're talking about where i drank it and i just go huh that's entirely different like that is doesn't taste like anything i've ever put in my mouth food wine otherwise that's just totally a different ethereal kind of experience i want to look this up you know and i go and look it up and i'm just like oh shoot and then it was just a rabbit hole you know it's crazy right yeah it is it, yeah good wine but yeah, in terms of diet, you know, it's like <laughs> I quit. I quit weekdays. Smart, because it's it becomes like a habit that's totally. not good. Yeah. Speaking of tonight is the friends reunion that my wife is. Oh, I didn't even know about that. Oh yeah, I know all about it. Where is it airing? Uh, I actually don't know that. I just know it's on TV. Okay, I'll find it. Yeah. Because. Yeah. My partner will love to watch that as well. Um, whose boards are you writing? Final question. So I ride uh, a lot of Timmy Patterson's and I ride John Pizel's. It just depends, you know. Um, I rode Timmy since I was a little kid and he's um, unbelievable and rad. And um, I started getting some Pizel's when I would go to Hawaii and the boards work so good. I'm like, oh my God, like, where have you been? You know, and so uh, it's been really fun. Um, I have a couple boards from Akila Aipa. He made yep. a couple Twin Fins that feel insane. Um, yeah, and I, I would you ride today? I rode Timmy Patterson. It was pretty cool. I rode the '84 synthetic, is the one that um, Italo has been riding. Oh, okay. I and don't know. Uh, yeah, it's it's a really really neat board. It's actually the one he jumped on. Um, oh, okay. not my specific board, but that was the model. <laughs> right, right. Um, but uh, it's actually a pretty funny story. It's like Timmy made it, and uh, there's you know he got one before he went to Australia. He's like, oh my god. I need more. And so he just fired off a bunch of them. And so um, they're just really easy to, super easy board to ride. And so, um, yeah, they're really fun, especially for around here. Why is it called 84 Synthetic? Because it's, uh, so Timmy's surfboard label was a synthetic back in 1984. That's how he started. Um, and it's a bit of an 80s model. It's, okay. It has a bit of a beak. Um, and it's like this sort of flat deck with... Um, Sort of a thin, yeah, it's a really interesting board. Um, There's that 80, uh, might have been 84 also, the Aki model that Rusty reintroduced a couple of years ago. Super similar. Okay. Except the those ones, Rusty would carry some more foam onto the rail. This has way less foam on the rail, but there's a bit of a deck. Yeah, that flat deck. I can't even imagine Idolo riding that board, or it doesn't look visually like that. So that's it interesting. It doesn't. Sort of hides it. He also has a lot of stickers on his board. He does, and I feel like the rails are even colored. Yes. So it does hide it. Yeah. That's funny. It's funny when you put a lot of stickers on a board, it actually changes the look of the board. It totally does. Yeah. It'll trip me out if the logo's even in the, the Shaper's logo. I'll get a new board, and I'm just like, I don't know about that. That looks wrong to me. Isn't that funny? Even though it's the exact right dimensions and everything, it just, I don't know. Sometimes I get think in my head. sticker too big, it bums you out. It's yeah, like, exactly. Dude. I just realized I forgot to give you a gift. Um, I've got two gifts. I know this is about Florence. Florence. If anybody wants to dress like John John, they should wear Florence Marine X. But if you want to dress dress like Pat O'Connell, you could shop in our merch store. Here's the Those are awesome. Clark Foam Clark knockoff Foam. logo. Thank you. What medium? Yep, that's perfect. And uh, Ooh, these are nice. And the cutoff. Can I ask you where you manufacture these t-shirts? Yes, I can. <laughs> yes, you can. I'll tell you. Uh, the Valpocalypse Now wow. cutoff tee. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> to defend against any of the Henri Vals that show up at Creek. Oh, my God. You can flex on them. That is so good. <laughs> you like yeah, that? Yeah, there's not much flexing at 5'6 <laughs> I, I can do. But maybe with this T-shirt, it'll help me. Exactly. They'll they'll feel intimidated by the Valpocalypse logo. Epic. Thank so, you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pretty uh, aggressive design there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to fend off the, the vowels, dude. Um, final thing I will tell you, yep. it's worth mentioning on air. When I was a kid, 
I'd seen The Endless Summer too. I think I rented it from wherever. And um, I was going to go buy. I saved up 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. I was going to go buy my first surf video. Went to Harbor Surfboards in Seal Beach. Uh -huh. Ended up not buying The Endless Summer too because I knew it was available for rent. So I ended up buying Jacked, which was a Tony Roberts O'Neill film. Roberts, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but when I was watching Endless Summer 2, I was just getting into surfing and you did this backside floater. And so, I don't know if it was Costa Rica or Nicaragua. It might've been Costa Rica. Yeah. And I was, I was telling my dad, my dad doesn't surf or anything, but I was just like, man, I don't get it. He like, he's at the bottom of the wave and he like ollies up onto the roof of the wave. It wasn't just like a floater that you transition onto. It was like you ollied from the trough up to the top. And I was like, I don't know how you would even do that. Like, and my dad's like, I don't know, if, if that's what he's doing, that's what you got to do. You got to ollie up there. And I was like, all right, cool. Oh, so God. yeah, that backside floater was like what I was committed to for the next summer it's of like trying to do. Rusty made me a board that, um, a replica of those boards and they're not even two inches thick. I believe that. Yeah. You cannot believe how skinny the, the, I just look at those and be like, there's no way I couldn't get to my feet on that now. Yeah. We, that's what I grew up right. I mean, that we all did. hindered my surfing so drastically. That's why today, like, again, surfing is blowing up, is you can ride anything. Yeah. There's a billion boards that, out, that are out there that are great. Yeah. Agreed. Well, I'm still trying to perfect that backside floater, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Pat. Cheers. Thank you.